Good evening and welcome to the second of two listening sessions for the planned Community Electric Vehicle or EV charging grant. I'm Jessica Wilcox, Supervisor of the Mobile Sources Section at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services or NHDES. And with me today are my colleagues Vanessa Partington, Grants Program Coordinator, and Becky Oler, our Bureau Administrator. The purpose of today's public listening session is to provide an informal opportunity for all interested parties to share their ideas and desires around funding electric vehicle charging stations in New Hampshire communities. We do not have a specific funding opportunity at this time, as we are still awaiting word from the federal government who we applied to for funding to develop this program. So at this time, we're just seeking your ideas and input for consideration. Right now, all online attendees are muted with no video feed, and you should be able to hear and see DES staff. Online attendees will remain in this state until we open the floor for input. If at any time during this meeting you encounter technical issues, please indicate that in the chat or email ms-grants at des.nh.gov. That's ms-grants at des.nh.gov. That is being monitored by a team member. First, you will hear from us. We will begin by providing a level setting overview of electric vehicles and EV charging. And we will provide some context about relevant DES charging programs, including this one. Then we will hear from you. We have a series of guiding questions and we will ask, we will be asking for you to provide written comments in the chat and to also raise your hand to provide oral comment if you wish. We'll provide some ground rules for that engagement when we do get to it. As time allows, we will also share a sampling of responses that were pre-submitted through a public comments form. At the end, we'll provide next steps, and around the one hour mark, when there's an appropriate break in the conversation, we'll take a 10 minute break. So first, let's get on the same page about electric vehicles and EV charging. We'll start with electric vehicles or EVs. Now there are three types of EVs. Battery electric vehicles or BEVs are powered solely by an electric battery. They are sometimes called all electric. And plug-in hybrid electric vehicles or PHEVs, which are powered by a combination of electricity and a gas engine. Now there are also hybrid electric vehicles which do not plug into charge. And since those hybrids don't plug into charge, the program we're focusing on today would serve drivers of BEVs and PHEVs. Now EVs offer numerous direct, direct benefits. Environmental benefits include reduced emissions of nitrogen oxides or NOx, which contribute to smog formation and acid rain, as well as greenhouse gases and other pollutants. This is particularly important since transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, especially in New Hampshire. EVs are much quieter than gasoline powered vehicles, thereby reducing noise pollution. And EVs are a key strategy for integrating renewable fuel sources into transportation. On the consumer benefit side, EVs are fun to drive, they can be cheaper to fuel and maintain, and they offer the convenience of charging overnight at home rather than having to go to the gas station for frequent fuel ups. Now you can see by this chart here that the cost of charging a 2023 Ford F-150 Lightning is about half the cost of fueling its gasoline counterpart meaning that even with the higher upfront cost, it can be less per year and less per mile to go electric. Now, when we compare gasoline vehicles to EVs, we see a steep difference in the amount of life, life cycle emissions. This includes everything from mining the raw materials to manufacturing the vehicles to their energy or fuel usage on the road over the lifetime operation. This study assumed a vehicle lifetime of about 178,000 miles per vehicle, and factored in an average US grid mix for the EVs. Now, while gasoline vehicles of today produce an average of 429 grams of CO2 per mile, EVs produce 203 to 254 grams of CO2 per mile, and they're projected to get as low as 147 grams per mile by 2035. Battery electric vehicles, or BEVs, are pure electric, powered only by one or more electric motors. Now they can only go as far as their battery charge will allow them, which is why charging stations are so important. Plug-in hybrid EVs or the PHEVs have both battery and a gas powered engine. The battery is small, but can still be charged. And when that battery range runs out, the gas engine seamlessly kicks in. 
since electricity is usually cheaper than gas, being able to charge a PHEV small battery frequently can greatly reduce the consumption of gas and increase that fuel efficiency. There are so many EVs to choose from. The market is growing fast. We're already seeing 60 plus different models of EVs available with many more on the way. Automakers are announcing investments into electrification constantly and debuting new EV models. And while we won't be talking about this much today, the same is happening with heavy duty vehicles and fleet vehicles as well. Electric versions of buses, street sweepers, refuse trucks, and multiple different truck bodies are hitting the streets. In New Hampshire, we have over 9,700 registered EVs. You can see by this chart that the number of EVs in each county is steadily rising since 2016. As time goes on, we expect to see an even more dramatic curve. And in fact, New Hampshire is projected to see over 140,000 EVs on our roads, with over 2 million across New England in the next 10 years. So now let's consider how to charge all of these EVs by talking about electric vehicle supply equipment or EVSE. Now, whenever we say EVSC, we're referring to the EV charger, charging stations as well as the equipment and infrastructure involved in supporting those charging stations. There are three distinct types of EV charging. The first is level one charging, which uses a standard three-pronged three outlet. And most EV drivers use level one charging at home, in their garage or driveway. Level one charging delivers two to five miles of range per hour of charging which can be all you need if, for example, you come home after work and plug in and just recharge overnight. Next is level two charging. Level two charging can be done at home, at work, or in public places. It requires a 240 volt outlet and a dedicated 40 amp circuit, similar to those large circular plugs that you may have seen for a stove or a clothes dryer. These charges can deliver 15 to 25 miles of range per hour, which makes them ideal at locations where you plan to spend some time. If installed at your workplace, for example, it could even help, off help offset the range of your commute. It could also be good for a place where customers might spend a few hours, like a movie theater or shopping center. Some plug-in hybrids and some older battery electric vehicles can only charge on level one or two, so having those can be important for those drivers. The final type is direct current fast charging or DCFC. You may have heard these called level three, but the distinction is that while level one and two use alternating current, DCFC uses direct current to fast charge a vehicle. DCFC can deliver 80% of a full charge in 20 minutes or 60 to 180 miles of range per hour, though this depends entirely on the type of charger and the EV's battery. DCFC does require three phase power and its own equipment pad. DC fast charging is great for fast charging those vehicles that are traveling long distances and for drivers who cannot slow charge on level one or two, such as drivers without parking spaces at home. It could also be good for drivers who need to supplement their level one charging at home. Now let's dig a little deeper into fast chargers. There are three types of charging plugs that you can expect at a fast charger. Think of this like the different types of cell phone charging connectors. The three different plug types are CCS, the combined charging system. This is also known as CCS1, and it's the standard charging plug for most EVs in the US today. Chatamo, which works for a few older EVs and for certain models of Nissan Leaf, and the Tesla charger, which only works for Tesla vehicles right now. Several vehicle manufacturers, however, including Ford, GM, Rivian, and Nissan, have announced that they're adopting Tesla's charging plug, which is called the NACS, or the North American Charging Standard. But for now, those vehicles aren't using NACS. Direct current fast charges are important as they deliver the fastest charge for EV drivers. This can facilitate long distance travel through or within New Hampshire. Fast charging can also provide an alternate to home charging and allow drivers to top off along the way. In New Hampshire, there are, there are 27 universal fast chargers and 40 Tesla chargers. For comparison, in Vermont, there are 43 universal chargers, 61 in Maine, and over 100 in Massachusetts, plus many more in Quebec. This means that EV drivers from out of state might have trouble driving to New Hampshire for tourism, recreation, or business. For level two charging, which is important for destinations where drivers spend more time, including our tourist attractions and commerce centers and workplaces, 
there are 170 public level twos in New Hampshire. In Vermont and Maine, there are about 300 apiece. And in Massachusetts, there are over 2,500. So we have some work to do. Now, installing EVSE is an investment. Level one charging is naturally the least expensive. Many, if not all EVs come with a level one charging plug. So all you would need there is a three prong household outlet. Now level two charging can cost several thousand dollars, but it really depends on installation and equipment and, and perhaps the prep work for that. Please also note that although the base hardware cost range on this slide starts at 1400, that's a cost for a network charger, not a home charger. DC fast charging can cost significantly more than that, ranging into the six figures. In addition, some charging projects may require utility infrastructure upgrades, which can vary greatly based on the utility, the equipment that may already be in place, and the project needs. Public level two and fast charging site hosts often also want to include some type of networking capabilities and point of sale capabilities so that drivers can pay for the charging that they use and the owners can gather data on that consumer usage. This can add additional costs as well. Now, all this is to say that installing charging, especially fast charging, can be expensive. So let's talk about some important funding programs. First, New Hampshire DES is administering the state's Volkswagen settlement funding. 4.6 million has been dedicated to EVSE and a Volkswagen DCFC EVSE RFP was previously made available. I know that's a lot of acronyms. RFP means request for proposals. And that's when we say, hey, we have funding for projects. If you want us to fund a project, please submit a proposal using these guidelines. We're probably gonna use that same structure for the next funding opportunity. So it's worth discussing this. So this was a competitive RFP, which was open from September 2021 to February 2022. It was open to any party that had the knowledge and expertise necessary to meet the requirements. NHDES received 43 eligible proposals, which represented 35 total sites across 25 towns and cities. We scored all 43 eligible options and selected 14. Now, some of those projects are in progress as we speak, we expect some of them will have charges online and ready for public use by the end of the year, while others may be opening early 2024. Some of these selected projects still are negotiating and finalizing contracts. And as contracts are finalized, we send them to the New Hampshire Governor and Executive Council for approval. If they do approve those contracts, we expect we'd see those projects complete and their charges online by late 2024. These sites will be all publicly available 24-7, They'll utilize that CCS connector and Shadamo plugs, and most of them will also have level two charges on site. This Volkswagen program, along the New Hampshire DOT's national EV, along with the New Hampshire DOT's national EV infrastructure program, or NEVI, for which they're receiving 17 million in federal funding, these are both targeting corridor sites meant to be near highways to facilitate EV travel on our major high transportation corridors. Now we can shift gears to the program we're talking about today, the Community EV Charging Grant Program. This program would also be through Federal Highways NEVI funds, but through the Discretionary Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Program, specifically the Community CFI subprogram. So back in June, NHDES applied for this program, and we're hoping that award announcements are made soon. Note that funding is not guaranteed, but we are hopeful. Now, because this is a community focused program, we're not targeting those corridor locations like we talked to on the last slide. We're not excluding them either. We're just not focusing on them like we did for that VW program. So the goals for this program are to enable New Hampshire residents to charge EVs and enable travelers to charge at their destinations, encourage EV drivers to drive to walkable downtown areas, enable residents without their own garages or driveways to charge their EVs, and to support historically underserved and often overlooked communities. As such, we have some priority location types, commerce and culture centers, rural locations, locations near multi-unit dwellings like apartment complexes, tourist attractions, parks and public spaces, and locations near transit hubs like bus or train stations. Now, as a reminder, at this time, please do not provide us with suggestions for locations or sites. We know there are some great sites that come to mind when we read these priorities. Our hope is that applicants will work with local leaders to develop project proposals that highlight a site's suitability. 
Now, because this funding is federally sourced, there are some strict minimum requirements and restrictions. While we welcome your input on our program development, we ultimately must adhere to these restrictions. All sites must support charging at least four vehicles simultaneously. We could potentially fund more than four ports, but not less. The ports can be all level two, all fast chargers, or some combination of both. All direct current fast chargers would have to provide each vehicle a minimum of 150 kilowatts. This is a federal minimum requirement and we, we cannot allow anything below that, although we could allow higher. Level two has a minimum of six kilowatt and has a caveat about letting drivers opt into accepting a lower rate, likely for a lower cost. All fast chargers must have those CCS1 charging plugs. We can't fund DCFC that doesn't have the CCS plugs, but we have two guiding questions that we're gonna go over today, which ask about other charging plugs. So we'll get into that shortly. There are also certain technical restrictions like the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA, also Buy America and point of sale restrictions. And we're gonna to need to follow all of those. Since this is a listening session and we're here for some input on some decisions to be made, we can't budge on any of these federal requirements. We're simply not gonna get into them today. If we are awarded funding and we open an RFP with program guidance and host a webinar, at that time, we'll provide more guidance. And finally, before we get to the questions and comments, let's look at some of the default structures that we'll be incorporating into this program. Project proposals would be scored competitively. Applicants would need to wait for their proposals to be scored, selected, and for a contract to be approved by New Hampshire Governor and Executive Council before they could proceed with any project work. We would need status reports throughout the project's lifetime. And yes, applicants are welcome to propose any sites in New Hampshire. Now we know from experience that these projects can be large and intricate, so we'd expect projects to have multiple partner entities. That said, only one entity could be the lead entity, and that lead entity is the one ultimately responsible for the project and the one who actually gets reimbursed for costs. We anticipate funding, we would fund some amount of infrastructure upgrades, but the amount itself would be determined. And as with all of our grants, funding would be reimbursement only, not upfront. So now that we have some framework for both EV charging and how our funding programs generally work, let's get into some specific guiding questions. The procedure for today's listening session will be as follows. We will ask a guiding question and ask you to enter your responses in the chat. If you would like to comment further, please do so using that same chat feature, not the Q&A function as this is a public forum and not everyone has access to that. We want your input and feedback. You are also welcome to ask clarifying questions, but we do not plan on answering any questions about our program or our priorities in this forum. This program would still be in development. We will notify you when a Q&A document is posted publicly. Now, DES staff will be monitoring the chat and will read certain comments aloud. We may also ask you to come off mute to clarify or explain further. And if you have a comment you want to expound on, please indicate that in the chat and then use that raise hand function. We can't guarantee everyone will get time to speak due to time constraints, but we'll do our best. We have also consolidated written comments that were received in a response to a public comment form that was available between September 20th and October 6th. I say consolidated because we received many responses and some of them echoed one another and others were lengthy. So in the interest of time, we have prepared those comments in a way to represent what we received. As time allows, after reading the questions and allowing time for your responses and comments, we will share some examples of what we received. If you're placing a comment in the chat, please make sure to include which question you're responding to or mark it as a general comment. If you see something in the chat that you agree with or you want to support, please use that little thumbs up emoji feature to give it a little thumbs up or other reaction so we can reduce the amount of repetition in the chat. This will just help us sort through the comments. As a reminder, please do not suggest individual sites and please keep your comments constructive and respectful. If they're not, I as the moderator, moderator will give one warning and then mute the individual and move on. Now NHDES will not necessarily address all comments and not all comments will necessarily inform program development. Our intent today is to learn from you. 
So we have solicited some input from municipalities, charging companies, utility reps, and members of the community at large. We try not to oversend invites and updates, but we felt this was very important, and we want a diverse and informed audience. So the image on this slide reflects the responses we received to the written comment form. Before we go any further, though, let's find out who's with us today. Please enter your response in the chat. Which sector do you best represent? Individual New Hampshire resident, community organization, local government, state or regional government, federal government, energy and environmental consultant or advocate, utility, EV charging company, solar or other electric service company, a private business interested in being a site host or other, and please clarify in the chat. Hi everyone, this is Vanessa. It looks like we have a lot of uh, folks joining us from our local, state or regional governments, as well as individuals and some community organizations. Excellent and welcome. Great, yeah. so now, oh, go ahead, Vanessa. Uh, we have a state rep on the call too. So. Oh, very yeah. much welcome. Thank you for joining us. Excellent. Now we will move into our, our guided questions portion so that we can hear from you. We will now unmute all participants and please be sure to remute yourself until and unless you're called upon to speak. As a reminder, if you wish to speak, please use the raise hand icon and wait for one of us to invite you to unmute. Also, as a reminder, please be respectful of each other as there may be differing viewpoints represented by the participants in the session. And in all cases, we ask that all participants honor the process of being able to hold a public input session to hear differing viewpoints and concerns by extending each other courtesy and civility. We will begin inviting public input at this time. What I'll do is I will read a question, ask for you to respond in the chat, and if you would like to expand on your on your selection, please use that raised hand feature. If we do call on you to speak, please ensure that your microphone is not muted and begin your comments by stating your name. Have we unmuted everyone? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Vanessa. So guiding question one, this one we are asking. DES is considering multiple subsequent rounds of the request for proposals and scoring each round individually. For example, if proposals were due Feb December 1st, February 1st, and April 1st, then proposals received by December 1st would be scored together, then proposals received by December by February 1st would be scored together, etc. This would let us start the contract phase for projects earlier and help communities sooner, although it may mean funds are used up before the final period. What do you think of this method? A, yes, DES should set up multiple submission rounds, allowing DES to potentially start contracting periods earlier. B, no, DES should consider all el eligible projects at the end of the request period, allowing all applicants the full period to submit their materials. Or C, other. As I mentioned, please put the question number and the letter selection in the chat, and, we're, and you're certainly welcome to raise your hand if you would like to clarify further. We have Nancy Hirschberg asking, would you roll those not approved into later rounds? That's an interesting question. And as I mentioned before, since this is funding, we're still waiting to hear whether or not we're awarded. We haven't yet begun developing a funding opportunity. So that's a that's a good food for thought, a good flag, Nancy, and something we'll certainly keep in mind. I think that was also suggested earlier as well. Um, for other responses, we're seeing one A and three Bs so far. And as I mentioned, we'd love to hear from you. This is your opportunity to talk to us. So if anybody would like to unmute, uh, not to unmute, to raise their hand and, and we'll call on you, we'd love to for you to explain further or share your thoughts further. Someone suggested, uh, Mary Beth Raven suggested, can you grant up to three or four in each submission period and then award the rest at the end of the full period? More good food for thought. Seen that comment, yep. Yeah, more good food for thought. Thank you, Mary Beth. Pat said A, because we need to get moving as soon as possible. 
Nancy Hirschberg said C. If a rolling into later rounds, A is fine, but by rolling those not approved into later rounds, it levels the playing field. Thank you, Nancy. And I don't see any hands raised at this time for more comment. Fair enough. We'll oh, give everybody three more seconds. Yep, we've got Tad Montgomery. Go ahead, Tad, if you'd uh, introduce yourself to the group and then um, you can share your comment. Um, good evening. I'm Tad Montgomery, energy and facilities manager of City of Lebanon. Um, is this the rough timeline that you are considering, December 1st, February 1st, April 1st? I'm sorry, Tad, I'm, I'm getting a little static with your mic. Can you repeat the last part of your question? Um, okay, maybe this is better. Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, is this the rough timeline that you all are considering, December 1st, February 1st, April 1st? Or is that just hypothetical? Yes, yeah, so that is a hypothetical at this point. Since we haven't been awarded funding, um, we're not exactly sure when that funding will be announced. And there, like I said, there is no guarantee. So this is just kind of a food for thought to give some parameters to how we might structure something like that. Okay, so my follow-up question is, um, I like other comments that have come with regard to this, but if it were to be spread out, there might be a bit of a learning curve that could be applied. So from the first round, lessons learned applied to subsequent rounds to improve the project. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. That's that's a good flag. Any more comments or anyone else want to share? Or respond to a comment that's been shared? And Judy Aaron um, commented, can't you split the total funding into tranches so that the funds aren't used up before the final period? And Pat Martin agrees with the learning curve perspective that Tad mentioned. Thank you. Thank you both. I don't see anyone with their hand raised. Great. We'll give everybody three more seconds. I always like to give a little time and it looks like we're a little smaller group here, so certainly feel free to uh, to raise your hand and speak. We do have time for that. All right. So let's see what the responses were that came through from that public comment form that I mentioned we had open from the end of September to early October. So in response to that, the majority of votes were for setting up multiple submission periods, item A. We also heard more charges are needed as soon as possible. The need is now. Getting consensus and planning permissions will take time. Build around the town budget and town meeting timelines. Multiple submission periods, staggered grant rounds, rolling out in stages will allow for broader participation, quicker deployment, and opportunities to learn from initial difficulties rather than all projects hitting simultaneous stumbling blocks, similar to what Tad was sharing. Allocate funds equally among the multiple rounds so as not to penalize applicants and resource poor communities that might take longer to prepare their proposal. So that's a sampling of what we've heard. Would anybody like to comment on that? We have Nancy Hirschberg. Go ahead, Nancy, if you'd introduce yourself, please. Sure. Um, I just want to um, explain what I meant by the rolling is that if you have three um, really fantastic projects in, in the first tranche and um and then later in, in later tranches they're, they're not even as good you might just choose one from the first one and then if you don't roll them in then they don't didn't have a chance to compete with the, the later ones so it just that's what i meant by level, leveling the playing field so thank you and thank you for that clarification appreciate it we have doria if you'd introduce yourself Hi, I'm Doria Brown. I'm with the city of Nashua. My question is about visibility of responses. For example, would the people responding in round two be able to look at the, or not responding, our proposals? Would people proposing in round two be able to see proposals from round one? Hmm. That could be uh, an, an equity issue because they would have time to prepare 
a proposal that potentially is better than people who weren't picked in round two. So if they were or weren't picked in round one, and if those people were rolled over to round two, they would have no chance. Thank you for that. And you know there are certain rules that the state abides by um, when we are receiving proposals until they are approved by governor and council. We don't um, share them publicly. So. I don't know, Be I know Becky's on the phone. Becky, I don't know if you have a better response to that or, or thoughts on that, but. Hi, everybody, uh, Becky Oler. Um, I don't have a specific response to that. Jessica does make a good point. Once we release an RFP, we keep all applications uh, confidential um, unless and until they are approved by the governor and, and council. However, there, there may be an, a way that we could share um, sort of best practices or something that we are seeing along the way. Yeah, the, the focus of this grant really is by, by federal design to be on the disadvantaged communities. Uh, and so we do want to do this in a way that makes sure that communities that have fewer resources still have an equal chance to access this. And we're, um, you know, sort of seeking ideas on how we can make sure that that happens. Thank you, Becky. Tad also commented, the technology is evolving so rapidly or rapidly, so multiple rounds would allow for the latest technology to be impl implemented in each round. Thank you. All right, let's move on to guiding question two. So we're asking, the NEVI standards require that all ports include CCS1 charging plugs but they do not prohibit the inclusion of other charging plugs. Now, while many vehicle manufacturers have signed on to produce that NACS capable vehicles, Tesla chargers throughout the state may already serve these vehicles. So taking this into account, which of the following would you recommend? A, DES requires NACS plugs in addition to CCS1 plugs. B, DES may fund NACS plugs in addition to CCS1 plugs, but not require them. C, DES should not fund NAX plugs whatsoever, or D, other. Remember to place the question number and your letter selection in the chat, and certainly feel free to expound and raise your hand if you'd like to share orally. Give folks some time to respond. We have Tad Montgomery with his hand raised. Go ahead, Tad. Uh, I'm wondering if someone who knows uh, charging plugs better than I do can describe the adapters that are available and what they cost and how available they are. They can go between these different plugs. Sorry, Ted, the last part of your, the very last sentence that you said got cut off a little bit from the static. Can you repeat that? Yeah, sorry. I'm wondering if someone who knows um, EV charging plugs better than I do can describe the different adapters that are available that allow someone to charge with one plug if they have a different kind of a system. Because that would kind of circumvent this whole problem. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I do know that there are adapters available, um, particularly like Tesla allows an adapter to use the CCS1 port but I'm not sure of the um, viability of adapters that go from CCS1 to Tesla. And that's just based on my experience when I was the clean cities director here in the state and I was working a lot in EVs and everything else. But that is certainly a good question. And if we could dig into it more if you want to put that question in the chat, Tad. And we hope to release a Q&A document at some point later on. So we could certainly dig into that and provide some further clarification. Jess, I'll jump in just a little bit on that, just <clears throat> because we're obviously seeing Tesla uh, working with other automobile makers and opening up their system uh, to other auto other types of vehicles. Um, I personally believe this is an indication that uh, they intend to sell anybody who would like to buy an adapter to use the Tesla stations. This is just uh, 
you know, trying to read the tea leaves on my part. Not a, a nothing has been announced by the company, but certainly the direction they're moving with this latest step would indicate that they intend to uh, enable access in the future. How, how far that future is, who knows? Still evolving. So we do have some responses to this in the chat. Um, it's a variety of A and Bs. It seems like B is the majority here. Um, Pat Martin commented, I have I read that Chatamo was the most widely available. Tad said having a good understanding of adapters. Oh, I'm sorry, we just went through that. And Nancy Hirschberg stated more and more vehicles will be next given the news in recent months, as um, Becky just stated too. Great, thank hey. you all. Hey Jess, can I just put a, a clarifying comment on the Chatamo sure, chargers? Yep. Um, I, I'm not sure if you touched on this earlier. I know you did in the previous <laughs> session, but that Chatamo really the only vehicle using the Chatamo plugs right now is Nissan. Um, and uh, we don't know what Nissan is planning to do in the future. So we don't, but we don't envision a lot of new vehicles um, outside of Nissan using the Chatamo plug. But um, an important thing to consider is that uh, a lot of these used EVs are the older EVs that will be more affordable to our lower income residents. And many of those same lower income residents don't have a way to install their own charger at home. So it will be important for the foreseeable future to ensure that there is public Chatamo parking, uh, 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 charging as well. Thank you, Becky. So now let's take a look at some of those responses that came in to that public comment form I mentioned earlier. So in that in those responses, it was almost an even split between A requiring and B may fund but not require, with B getting a few more votes. Comments also came in as follows. There are enough NAX plugs available now. The majority of unmet need is CCS1. Automaker support is still evolving. Having the most accessibility early in the rollout of the stations will enable a good reputation for the charger program. DES should require every start charging station to support NACs and CCS1 for at least the, the next five years of funding. Build for the future. The evidence is clear that NACs will be the future standard. Requiring CCS1 for backwards compatibility for the time being makes sense but all chargers should include NACs as well. And give applicants the flexibility to submit applications given their unique needs. So echoing a lot of what we're hearing here today. So now we'll move on to guiding question number three. We're asking, while the Chatamo charging system has become less common on newly announced vehicles, it may still be necessary for legacy EVs and used EVs. Like the previous question, which of the following would you recommend? A, DES requires Chatamo plugs in addition to CCS1 plugs. B, DES may fund Chatamo plugs in addition to CCS1 plugs, but not require them. C, DES should not fund Chatamo plugs whatsoever. Or D, other. Please place your comments in the chat and please do raise your hand if you'd like to share. We have a comment from Judy. Charges should be as flexible as possible for all consumers. Thank you, Judy. And I'm seeing mostly B and 1C as submitted answers in the chat. Uh, still waiting on responses. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, we'd love to hear from you. Please do raise your hand if you wish to speak. This is your, your opportunity to share. We'll give everybody a few more seconds here. Uh, 
Okay. So let's take a look at some of the responses we received to that written comment form that was open from September, end of September to October. The response, the majority selected B, may fund but not require. What we were hearing is many people can't afford to purchase a newer EV only because there are some legacy Chatham vehicles out there should you consider including them. They'd also be perfectly fine with excluding those few vehicles from this pro funding program. Chatabo is not used by any cars and it should be phased out. Used EVs are going to be most accessible to low income people who need charging more often. So having these plugs available would be important for equity and keeping cars in service for longer. Adapters might be a solution there. I own a LEAF with Chatamo, and I'm aware it is a dying standard in the US. The vehicles are limited in range overall. We should have some charges available, but not invest heavily. Give applicants as much open-ended opportunity as possible to make their case. So similar to some of the comments we're hearing here tonight. All right, guiding question number four, availability. We're asking, the CFI guidance for community programs states that chargers must be available at least as frequently as the business hours of the site they're installed upon. Now in our Volkswagen DC fast charging RFP, we did require 24 seven availability and access. DES is considering requiring 24 seven availability for chargers funded under this grant as well. What do you think of this? A, DES should require all chargers to be open 24 seven. B, chargers should be open at least as frequently as business hours, but DES should favor projects that propose more availability. C, DES should require DC fast chargers to be open 24 seven, but not level two chargers. D, DES should require level two chargers to be open 24 seven, but not DC fast chargers, or E other. Please remember to put the question number and the letter code that best aligns with your response in the chat. Feel free to add your comments and raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Going back to the last question regarding the chat amount, Tad had commented, Chatamo plugs and cables should be designed to be easily replaced with a different plug slash cable in the future. And so far for question number four, I'm seeing a in the chat as the predominant answer. Thank you. Anybody wish to expound further or have any thoughts, more additional thoughts on this? Nancy Hirschberg commented, um, there may be some exceptions. Some businesses that cannot be open 24-7 Give preferences to open 24 seven, but let people make the case if they cannot. We have two responses of B. Judy Aaron said some businesses may not want to have cars by their businesses during off hours for security reasons. And we have Doria with her hand raised. Go ahead, Doria. Um, one thing that I'd really like to see is the opportunity to have chargers on during the day or during business hours and then allow for um, the chargers to be utilized maybe for city vehicles as we transition to EVs during the evening hours to charge. And I um, would kind of like to see that sort of flexibility as we move forward. Thank you, Doria. Same with businesses. If a business has a EV fleet, let's say you're um, a food delivery company or you're a restaurant, maybe during the time when your restaurant isn't operating and people wouldn't be eating there, um, you can charge your uh, business vehicles. Thank you. Mike Moser commented, I think businesses should have the flexibility, especially if they are not going to charge a fee uh, during charging. And Tad stated, I'd like to hear other reasons why site hosts would not want their chargers to be on or available 24 uh, seven. Speaking to that, I think we had some comments in the earlier session about um, snow parking bans and uh, insurance concerns. 
Yes, thank you, Vanessa. All right. Anyone else wish to share or comment further or respond to a comment that we received? Give that three second warning before we move on. Okay, so let's take a look at the sampling of comments we received to that public comment form. So the majority selected A, requiring all charges to be open 24 seven. Some of those comments were, off-grid solar power provides daytime charging only, any level two sites requiring 24 seven co coverage should include funding for external batteries. We're never going to get full EV acceptance until more charges are available at all hours of the day. As an EV owner for 10 years, the charger availability is becoming a huge problem as more EVs hit the road. Accessibility is paramount for EV users. Simplicity, and most chargers are not going to require on-site management. Some workers start early or finish late. Others work shifts. Some people travel overnight. 24-7 could open the charges up to potential security issues. Cameras could be a solution there. And DC fast charges are frequently used during longer trips and by out of state visitors and should be available 24 7. Oops, getting a little ahead of myself here. 24 7 to accommodate. They are the destination themselves. By contrast, level two chargers are, with the exception of, of ones located at a hotel or overnight destination, they're nice to have at a destination that EV driver is visiting. Therefore, the level two charger is mostly going to see demand when the business or attraction it is attached to is being visited. Some places don't allow overnight parking. Consider winter parking bans, as Vanessa mentioned earlier. So that is a sampling of our responses. Next question, guiding question number five, infrastructure. We're asking, now while charges are can be expensive, the cost of infrastructure upgrades and other site work, sometimes called make ready costs, could cost even more. Some sites may need more upgrades than others. DES could fund some degree of these costs, but at the, total, at the expense of the total number of projects funded. How do you believe DES should balance these two priorities? A, DES should maximize funding of make ready costs, even if this means minimizing the number of projects that get funded. B, DES should fund much of the make ready cost, even if this means reducing the number of projects selected. C, DES should fund some of the make ready cost, ensuring more projects can be funded. D, DES should fund minimal make ready costs, ensuring the maximum number of projects can be funded. Or E, other. Please remember to put the question number and comment and the letter code in the chat. And feel free to comment or raise your hand if you'd like to comment orally. We have Doria uh, with her hand raised. Go ahead, Doria. Hi. So I think um, I like the idea of an other option. So one thing we were interested in was ensuring that we could fund make ready costs for nonprofits and communities, while um, maybe businesses that have more funding and um, are in this business could fund their own make ready costs, but I'm sure that um, other people might have different opinions on the business side. Thank you, Doria. Appreciate that. Anyone else have thoughts on that or want to respond to any comments? And you can go ahead. Uh, we uh, submitted a proposal for the charging and fueling infrastructure grant now um, we saw roughly 90 public chargers around the city of Lebanon. And we had the darndest time finding anyone who was interested in owning any of those EVFCs, especially the DC fast chargers. So 
if if the ES is going to require the owner to cough up the make ready charge, I think it's going to make that um, even more difficult to um, make happen. Thank you, Tad. Appreciate that and, input. And Judy, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you for doing this, by the way. Um, so, you know, I, I, this, this is a great question, um, but I also have a question for this question as to why do we have to lay out the money up front and get reimbursed? Why doesn't the state, through our, the state treasury, offer a zero interest loan to the project or the people who are doing the project, which would be paid back later with the with the reimbursement from this grant, much like they do with FEMA projects. I think you know that that might help um, you know a smaller business or a nonprofit to be able to um, act the funds that they may not have right away in order to get their project up and running. Interesting. Thank you for that. I think we had kind of a similar question on the earlier listening session as well. And um, as I, if you haven't put that question in the chat, it's something we can certainly look into. We're anticipating posting a question and answers document at some point when we um, launch the web page for this program. So it's something we could certainly look into and respond to. I'm just not sure. Um, you know, I'm not sure of the details behind putting together that type of a of a funding instrument, but certainly something we can look into. Thank you. Nancy Hirschberg has her hand raised. Um, if you'd introduce yourself and go ahead, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess I see this as an equity issue. Either the project scores well because it's a needed important place to have a charger or it doesn't. And if it does, you can't install it without this, these, these, the upgrades and so forth. So it's a cost of the project. And if you're a community that doesn't have the funds to do that, um, you know, you can't make it happen, even if you get the, the grant, if you don't fund it. So I, I do feel pretty strongly that, um, that, um, um, it's a huge barrier. I know we have a project in Wolfboro that we can't do because we need three phase power and it's just too expensive to get it there. Um, so um, it won't happen. So unless we get some money. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Looks like we have a couple comments in the chat. Pat states, when I plan a trip in my leaf with 149 miles of range, I drive from from fast charger to fast charger to get my to my destination. Not sure I could do that throughout NH. And we had some answers. It looks like C. We had three people answer C, one person B. And they stated make ready costs are real and can make or break projects. It's an equity issue too. That was that was Nancy again. And Judy stated also, why do we have to lay out the money up front and get reimbursed? Again, the zero interest loan comment that she brought up. Thank you, Judy. I see Christina Hall with her hand up. Hi, yes. Um, so with the, the funding that may, may be coming down, is what is the timeline on how much time do you have to actually get approval from your town to actually, because, you know, when, in town communities, you have to wait and you only have one time a year that you can actually um, go in front of your select board or, or whoever to actually get that money in place. So, um, you know, I, is there a time, are you going to be able to lay out money and for the different projects so that the town process can actually work for those smaller communities that, you know, have to go for town vote? Well, that's a great um, flag and something that certainly has been raised that we would need to consider. Um, I don't know that we've thought through to how we would respond at this point. As I mentioned, we applied for the funding 
we're still waiting to be awarded, but these are all, this is why we're inviting this kind of comment. What things do we need to be thinking about um, if we're going to structure a funding opportunity that's accessible to folks? So thank you for that comment. Yeah. Well, and I, and I <laughs> wanted to speak earlier, but I, I couldn't figure out on this phone how to oh. raise my hand. I'm sorry. Or and I still can't find the chat on here. So um, I'm usually on a computer. Oh, no. But um, in that same lines, you know, um, just, you know, you asked about the different um, prior to the different timelines, um, you know, of, of rolling out the projects. And, and again, um, just making sure that the towns can actually submit on those on those proposals um, or because if in if with a grant and such that they have to have approval before before they're selected, you know, just just making sure that that process can work for the for the towns. Thank you. That's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Becky. Yep. Sorry, if, if I can just weigh in here, we we have uh, seen this uh, sort of loud and clear on, on many of our previous ongoing grant programs. And um, I think that we will do everything within our power to get an application period out prior to town meeting time or a, a, a solicitation out prior to time meet, town meeting time. But I would encourage communities and we should probably make a plan to get to just do a broadcast information about this to all communities, but I would encourage communities to, even if there isn't a specific solicitation available by then, which I can't imagine we won't have this out before March, <laughs> uh, but it'll depend on when we get the federal money. But I would I would recommend that that the communities that rely rely on town hall uh, or um, at the annual town meeting get a proposal before the community that would allow them to do this. Uh, you know, should funding become available. Thank you, Becky. Good flag. Nancy, Nancy Hirschberg followed that up with, to get things on the warrant, we need the information in January at the latest. Uh, thank you for making us aware of that, Nancy. Trying to think, do we have any questions and risk to get some more clarity on that? Um, um, she's got her hand up. Yes, please. So um, I don't think it was stated or I, I don't know what the deal is, but um, are these matching grants? Does the town have to come up with money? Because if we're just accepting money, it's my understanding we don't have to go to town meeting. Yes, so generally federal funding requires that 80-20 split. Okay. So 80% of the funding could be okay. used towards, okay. towards a so grant. Yep. Okay, so we would have to go to town hall. Oof, that changes everything then. Yeah. When you say it changes everything, curious to know if you could expound on that more. Well, just that um, if we really think we could put in a warrant this year saying, um, you know, this is what we want to do. We're hoping to get funds and, you know, this is how much money the town would need to do. But we'd have to do that. We'd have to get going that right now because then we'd go through the public process, which all happens. We'd have to have it in beginning of November, go through the public hearings in November and December, um, unless we did it late by petition, I guess. But that's that's the way we would have to do it. So um, it's good to know. And you mentioned doing it late by petition. Can you expound on that? A yeah, little bit instead of um, the town, a town entity, um, like in my case, the energy committee going through getting the selectmen to vote on it and getting approval so that in the warrant article, it would say the selectmen approved the, or, you know, a, a, a vote, you know, voted to approve this. Um, we would could as an individual, I could I don't think I could do it as the energy committee, but I could do it as an individual, put it in as a petition. They're at the end of the meeting. They don't have as much weight because they haven't been through this process and so forth. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, our budget hearings are wrapping up now, too.
We'll give everybody a few more seconds. Anyone else want to respond or echo anything that's been said? All right. Let's see the types of responses we received to that written comment form that we had publicly posted. So as you can see here, the majority of the response was C, and that is NHDES should fund some of the make ready costs, ensuring that more projects can be funded, kind of echoing some of what we're hearing here. Some of those responses included, we're behind in infrastructure and need whatever it takes to get it in place. A two-tiered approach could be applied. No coverage of make ready costs for level two EV chargers that can be installed and scaled up quickly with make ready cost coverage reserved for level three EV chargers, those DC fast chargers that take longer to deploy and face costly or future upgrades. Selected sites should be chosen for available utility and cost effectiveness, not pay to bring utilities to a non-developed site. Setting some make ready cost ceiling or limits will ensure that this program funds destination and downtown sites with existing power supplies. On one hand, the make ready costs are a heavier burden in small rural resource poor communities. On the other, having more charging stations is critical for rural residents to be able to access the benefits of EV ownership. The state should decide how much to cover on a case by case basis with more money being reserved for more rural and lower income areas and for lower income businesses. Covering make ready will increase the likelihood that applicants will invest in that DC fast charging. So we still have um, some more guiding questions to get to, but at this time, it's, the, it's kind of close to the top of the hour. We're just gonna take a quick break, quick five minute break here, and then return and reinitiate this public comment. So we'll see you all back at 8.07. Thank you.
Okay, we are back. Thank you all for returning. Go ahead and share my slides again here. And we have now entered the general input se section of this session. What we want to know is, do you have any other feedback or input that you'd like to have to add to this? Is there anything that we haven't addressed or thoughts that you're that are on your mind? Please post your comments in the chat. And of course, feel free to raise your hand to speak. So Judy Aaron stated in the chat, definitely agree that the rural areas are going to be much different than the urban areas and their funding needs will be different. And um, for comment up first, we have Nancy Hirschberg. Go ahead, Nancy. Hi, so I have three things. Um, the first is, are boats considered here? Boat charging infrastructure? So I'll just throw that out there for you to think about because we're getting requests now from people. Um, the second is, I know this is going to sound weird because who likes extended warranties, but um, I, I'm reading so much about the problem of broken um, chargers. Um, and I know we had our charger broke. We had an, we have an extended warranty and within hours they were there and fixed it. So building something like that into it. So for communities, again, an equity issue that, um, you know, you have the ability to get it fixed. And then third, I don't think there's anything you can do about this, but for a small town like us, taking up four parking spots downtown is death to the project. I mean, really, really hard that we would have to fight really hard. And I, I know that you said that's a federal restriction, but if there's any way to split those off, move them in two different areas or something, that would be really important for a small place. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. All great comments. And one thing to note with this um, national electric vehicle infrastructure funding of which this, so this is coming from the federal level, and there were two different buckets of this funding, some of which is formula funding that the state DOT is getting a portion of, and then there's this discretionary funding, but it really is dedicated to electric vehicle charging. So unfo unfortunately, like boats charging that shore power that, that would allow boats to connect would not be covered under this grant. However, DES also administers the, the EPA's Diesel Emissions Reduction Act funding through our state clean diesel grant program. And Shore Power is one of the eligible project options through that funding. So I know Vanessa is our grants program coordinator. Maybe Vanessa, you could put some uh, that the link to our DES uh, New Hampshire Clean Diesel Grant Program webpage in there. It's something you may want to check out, Nancy, and share with your um, interested parties as well. And thank you for the other comments. Certainly things that we need to be thinking about and mindful of if we move forward with the development of this funding opportunity. In our, again, this is Becky again, just jumping in, in our in our current funding programs, both um, both our EV charging programs right now and also our, well, basically those, we do require that the, uh, that the chargers have a five-year service contract and they must be in use for five years and we do fund the warranty for that so i don't think that we would have a reason to do any differently on this program just off the top of my head thank you becky we also had tad with his hand up go ahead tad um echoing nancy's comment about taking up four parking spaces in the middle of a downtown um severe difficulties with that and and pushback uh, from the public, the non EV public. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is that when we were first negotiating with Electrify America, um, actually, is my mic working? Is it behaving? Yes, actually now? working great right now, okay. Ted. Thank you. Um, uh, the city thought rather fiercely about what other objectives we wanted to meet um, our planning objectives through the location of um, EV charging stations. Um, and unfortunately, our efforts in that particular round of this work didn't come through fast enough. So Electrify America went out and installed their charger on a strip in a Walmart parking lot. Um, I think most of the city council and most of us in the planning office and 
public works and city staff in general would much rather have encouraged those chargers to be located near our downtown in a way that would support local businesses and bring visitors to our downtown area. So I'd encourage the DES to consider some kind of way to also encourage that. Thank you, Ted. That's um, a useful comment. Not sure of off the top of my head. Like I said, there there are certain minimum requirements that are overarching over this funding. So it's something we would have to look into as as to whether or not you know these are what they're requiring is that these are sites that have the four you know four chargers, whether it's all level two or DC fast charging. So I'm not sure that there's going to be a lot of flexibility there, but um, thank you for for flagging that. And maybe playing off of what Tad was um, saying is we have a lot of people that, you know, individuals and um, town town representatives on the calls today, and it's all in how you frame it, right? If you're bringing business into small businesses, that's a lot different than taking up parking spaces. <laughs> um, next, we have Judy. Go ahead, Judy. Thank you, and thank you for taking my question or my comment. Yeah, you know, um, I'm thinking about the need for these charging stations in rural communities. Maybe, you know, something like, um, I'm thinking like, you know, the village stores, the pick your own places, the um, more agricultural type places where people would go and, I don't see the places which would be best served by something like this. Um, I don't see that those places would have necessarily a space for four charging stations. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking that um, there, there is a little bit of inequity here because as I stated before in one of my comments, you got to take into consideration, or at least DES has to take into consideration that, there, that the rural areas are so different than the urban areas in what they need and supply. Uh, and we want to bring people to those rural areas to help bolster economic development. So it's sort of like, you know, um, a double-edged sword here. I don't know what the answer is, but I think you need to be cognizant of the issue that some of these smaller rural areas where you're looking to put these EV charging stations are not going to kind of fit nicely into these parameters that you're starting to establish for these groups. The folks help to get those things put into place. So, just want to put that out there. Thank you so much, Judy. Appreciate that. Good. And go ahead, Doria. I just wanted to add that in Nashua, we're looking at this in a, I think, with a different lens. So, a lot of people see charging stations as a way to bring people to their communities to shop downtown or experience the community or for, for people who are in a part of the community. Um, in Nashua, we noticed that we have an 85% increase in electric vehicle registrations from, I think it was 2015. And we know that more and more community members are choosing to drive electric. So we're looking to see how we can get more of those level two charging stations in proximity to our downtown, but also in proximity to new housing developments in the area that don't have chargers so that we can encourage people who drive electric to still choose to rent in Nashua and have access to those chargers. And it makes it something to be more palatable to community members. I also like the addition of the DC fast chargers. So if you do a, a charging project with, let's say one DC fast charger and um, for level two chargers, you allow for community members who live in the area, rent in the area, or maybe aren't able to install a charger in their home to utilize the 
level two chargers, and then you have the DC, uh, the DC fast charger available for those people who are visiting. And um, that is something that would work really well in our garages in Nashua because we have one um, on High Street that would be accessible to some new apartments that have come up and level two chargers for them. And then we also have the Performing Arts Center that we just put up. The DCF fast charger would be really nice there for people who are maybe just there for an hour or so, but need a, a higher or a faster charge to get back to Massachusetts or Vermont or wherever they came from to enjoy a performance. So I think that thinking about this on a community level where and telling people this charger is going to allow you to be able to access an EV and make it an option for you might help with adaptation in uh, communities. And I, I know that might look different for rural communities, but at the end of the day, these chargers need to be available for, for community members to level those equity issues. Thank you, Dorian. We have a couple of comments in the chat. Mary Beth Raven commented, Peterborough put their four chargers in a downtown park parking lot. They are also considering chargers in the library parking lot. Pat Martin stated, I've seen chargers often in town office parking lots or public services such as police, fire, um, Department of Public Works parking lots near downtown. And Tad commented on Electrify America's constraints. Mary Beth Raven stated, I'm a bit baffled at why gas stations are not simply eligible for grants to install EV chargers. People will stop and use the bathroom, get snacks. Maybe they will buy more snacks if they have to wait 20 minutes for their cars to charge. And we have Nancy Hirschberg. Um, go ahead, Nancy. Thank you. Um, I just want to revisit the timing again. So it sounds like it's it's not likely that you'll hear immediately so that we could pull together. I mean, those of us who have attended are kind of in the know now. So in theory, we could get our act together and and get a proposal in to get something on the warrant articles. But uh, for those that miss it, what what's the timing of that you hope or expect? How how long will you be, um, you know, because in in other words, if we miss this spring's town meeting, you know, will you will there be an opportunity next year to do it? The following year. That's a a good question, Nancy. And I think the challenge is that, as you mentioned, we haven't received this funding yet. Um, that award notification date has moved a little bit. I know at the federal level, they're also grappling with the amount of funding that they're trying to push through. So I think that has put a little delay in their ability to notify um, applicants of an award and we are an applicant. So we have not been notified whether or not we're receiving this award and we're not even guaranteed that we're going to receive it. But what, what we do know is that the funding that became available earlier this year that we applied for is funding that is only a small portion of the 1.25 billion dollars that actually is dedicated into this this pot this community charging pot at the federal level so they had only re released 350 million earlier this year we applied for 10 million there's no guarantee we'll get all of that there's no guarantee we'll get any of it but because we know they've only released a portion of it we anticipate that there could be other uh, opportunities to apply for funding at that federal level and so that could once again change you know ultimately the release date and the timing of all of this anyway so right now you know it's it, it is some speculation we're anticipating we might get an award but there there is no guarantee um, but we anticipate there could be future opportunities as well so that's why it's so important that we hear now and we can kind of start to you know put plans in place um, and prepare ourselves for um, when and if we are awarded that funding Becky, did you want to add anything there? Um, yeah, I think that was a good overview. I guess the one thought that I would just put out there is that is that we are not going to be uh, soliciting proposals just from uh, local governments. This is going to be wide open to the public sector. So um, I, we do totally understand the town meeting time frame, and we will do what we can to try to get something out. I mean, 
I think we can talk through, uh, converse with our regional planning commissions that I think represent pretty much all the towns in, in New Hampshire um, and let them know that we think this is coming and all the communities should keep this in mind. But um, a community could also partner with a private sector company to do this and the company would get the money and I mean, the, the town may, if it's going to go on town owned property, you'd, you'd still have your own issues to deal with, but but do consider um, partner partnering with private sector folks. Thank you, Becky. We have Judy with her hand raised. Go ahead, Judy. So just a, a out of the blue question, do you know how towns or municipalities are incorporating this kind of thing into their master plans have have towns already done that do you, do you know do you have any kind of idea or advice on how that how that plays out only at a very high level as i mentioned i, I used to direct our clean cities program and engaged a lot with towns and cities and businesses and fleets around the state and i do know that often we would get inquiries about you know, from towns and cities asking for either model language or what other towns had done to incorporate um, EV readiness into either a master plan or to um, local ordinances and things of that nature. But I don't, we don't track that formally. So, um, so we really don't, you know, don't have our fingers on the pulse of actual tallies of what's taking place. Does that answer your question? Well, given your yeah, given your background, thank you, and I appreciate that. And given your background and familiarity with that, is there any chance you might be able to send me some kind of model language for for that? I certainly can, Judy. Um, yeah. You can use my legislative email. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat so you can see it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Anyone else? We can also post that response with the presentation, correct? Yes. The floor is yours, folks. And, and like I said, this doesn't have to be restricted to any of the questions, the guiding questions that we've asked thus far or any of the comments. Um, this is how do we make if we get this funding, how do we make a funding opportunity that is accessible um, for folks and what are your concerns and what is your input from your experiences, whether you've applied for funding yourselves in the past, et cetera. So I want to hear from you. So Nancy commented in the chat in Wolf Pearl, we built it into our master plan, not specific chargers or locations, but building the infrastructure. And I don't see anyone else with their hand raised at this time. So. All right, so let's talk about what types of responses we received in that public comment form that we had posted. Responses came in such as remain flexible as new advances are being made. Incentivize cost effective destination chargers. Level two is a cost effective good fit. Glad to see DC fast charging is also encouraged, but not required in this program. Provide some technical support and assistance. Ensure that funded projects are dispersed throughout the state and the regions, including rural versus urban settings, much of which we're hearing tonight. Renters, multifamily housing, dense commercial areas, they need reliable level two. Prioritize volume of drivers, and accessibility of new and existing charging sites. Priority should be given to more rural and less developed location. Private interests will first install charging stations where users congregate. We need safe, well-lit charging locations. An applicant should be scored on cost optimization and specifically cost per stall versus project cost share. Any comments there? Any additional thoughts or comments there?
Mary Beth states in Merrimack, we have chargers at the outlet mall that the mall businesses installed. So we are lucky there. At least we have some chargers. If you can get a business like that to put them in, that is great. Excellent. All and right. Pat, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No. Um, Pat Martin asked, is Massachusetts the only state that offers free charging? And then um, Doria also has her hand raised. Um, I will just respond quickly to the Massachusetts question. I'm not, I know that they have a program. I think it's more EV. I don't know that it provides free charging, but I could be wrong. Um, but there is a alternative fuels data center, which is a, a website that's supported by the US Department of Energy that tracks laws and incentives around the nation. Um, and certainly that's one of the little tabs. If you go to afdc.energy.gov, you can go to that laws and incentives tab and search, um, you know, specific inquiries like that to learn more. And go ahead, Vanessa, you said somebody has their hand raised. Uh, yes, Doria, go ahead. Have I just wanted to add that I think it's really important that communities see this as an opportunity to own their own chargers. Um, this is a, a great way to put more value in your parking lots. And it's something that has a, a pretty low maintenance. You, you put them in, you can work with a company for maintenance and, and pay for it through the profits you'd be gaining from charging for charging if you choose to do it that way. Um, I think that we should prioritize communities that want to own their own chargers instead of um, private industry coming in and um, setting prices per profit instead of communities setting prices for their community members to be able to continue to afford charging. Interesting. Thank you, Dory. Anyone else, Vanessa? Or? Um, Tad commented that a lot is in flux right now, like the Public Utility Commission discussion of demand charges for EV charging. It's hard to keep up to date with all that's going on. And then um, folks mentioned free charging in various locations. All right, so what happens next from here? After both of these listening sessions today, we will ultimately consolidate comments received, post the recordings in slide deck, and post our responses on the NHDES website. So please be patient while we prepare that web page and get everything posted. We will ultimately be emailing you. We have your contact information to let you know when that's available. We will consider the comments received and we'll develop some programmatic standards. Hopefully we get funding. If we do, we're gonna publish a request for proposals. Sign up for that transportation, for our transportation infrastructure or NEVI mailing list to stay up to date. And I know Vanessa, you can put the link to that in the chat. And contact us at ms-grants at des.nh.gov if you've got any questions about tonight's presentation or this slide deck. And that is all I have for you all. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining and wish you a great night. And we have posted this um, session till 9 p.m. So I'm not gonna close down right now. We'll leave it open and certainly um, feel free to uh, unmute or write any additional comments if, you have, if you've got any last minute thoughts. Thank you again for your time tonight. So we have um, Mary Beth with her hand raised. Go ahead, Mary Beth. I can't hear you, Mary Beth. You might be muted. Yeah, I still can't hear you, Mary Beth. If you're having trouble mute, unmuting, you can always type your comment in the chat. Uh, let's see, there's something in the chat. Oh, never mind. Uh, maybe that was uh, an accident. Now we have Judy raising her hand. Go ahead, Judy. 
Thank you again. Um, I'm just curious if, you know, we're talking about specific fund money that, um, grant money that, that um, the, the state of New Hampshire may be getting. Do, do you foresee any other grants coming from other places uh, or other parts of the federal government um, that would be coming our way to the state for uh, expansion of um, EV charging stations? So through that national EV infrastructure funding, which is just a very large program, there has been different buckets of funding um, for different types of programs. We talked about DOT getting that um, formula funding for the corridors. We talked about this discretionary funding, which actually was broken into two components at the federal level. Uh, they had $1.25 billion dedicated to additional corridor funding, and then $1.25 billion dedicated to community funding, of which they, they released only 350 million of that um, earlier this year for additional corridor and community charging programs. And, and DES applied for community charge for the community charging program and DOT applied for some additional funding through the corridor charging program. We're still waiting to hear whether or not we get that funding, but that's only a small portion of that larger billion, 1.25 billion pot for each of those additional um, buckets. And then just recently, um, Federal Highways released funding that was part of a 10% set aside under this larger umbrella of funding too. So now here's a third arm of funding that um, was released. And that was specific to a very targeted list of charging stations that are really not, not operable right now. Um, so we're, we are seeing different um, releases of different amounts of funding, and we do anticipate that there are going to be um, more coming down from this larger pool of funding. Um, it's been currently all through federal highways. I'm not aware of any other agencies at this point that, that have funding dedicated solely towards EV charging infrastructure, but I believe that some agencies will have funding for um, electric vehicles, commercial electric vehicles, and things of that nature, and so we may be seeing these over the next several years. Um, but certainly there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of funding coming down the pike. And as I mentioned, that AFDC.energy.gov, that site that the U.S. Department of Energy maintains, does track um, funding and incentives nationwide, so that they're a good source for um, tuning in to see what's available, whether federal or even they also track utility incentives and things of that nature. So um, we can put a link to that source in the chat as well. Or, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, no, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess, you know, my takeaway from all of this is, you know, you got, you got a lot of homework to do and, and kind of figuring out how to put this program together. But I really and truly hope that you will keep in mind, bear in mind, um, trying to help some of the smaller communities, um, you know, the, the Alsteads and the, um, the Walpoles of, of, of the state who, you know, they're smaller communities and it may be more difficult for the rural parts of of our state be able to make a move on this because you know they may not have the resources or even the space or the place to do something like this, even though it would be sorely needed um, and desired uh, simply to to help not only their own citizens that are traveling in and about the area, but also for tourists and um, I, you know, I just, I just hope that you will um, carve out some, some good considerations for our rural areas uh, who are underserved right now. So thank you. Thank you, Judy. Appreciate that. That input. We also have some comments in the chat. Uh, Mayor Beth stated, I'm concerned that EV chargers also require you to have a cell phone and download an app that 
is another accessibility issue. Not everyone can afford a phone. Why can't the chargers just take credit cards like a gas pump? Is that a concern at all? Yeah, and actually th this bucket of funding, so we mentioned that this is coming from the National EV Infrastructure Funding Program or NEVI program, and there are um, some standards and requirements that are placed on that funding. Um, one of which does apply to um, payment options. And I do believe that there have to be multiple payment options made available so that it's not just a subscription, not just an app, but that also folks can access that, um, pay for that via credit card as well. Um, so I think that that is something that's part of those minimum requirements if memory serves, but certainly something we need to be, be looking into and keeping in mind. And Mike Moser stated, in addition to CFI and NEVI formula funding, DOT will have money available from two programs in the future, which are CMAC and CARBON programs. Thank you, Mike Moser. That's all I'm seeing right now. Uh, thank you. A lot of people are saying thank you. So thank you, guys. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate the input and the engagement this evening. Um, as I said, I, we're going to stay on till the top of the hour in case anyone else has anything, additional thoughts to share. Feel free to put comments in the chat. Um, we're here, you know, we're here for you and we appreciate you being here for us as well. Thank you again.